The Deck of Many Things is one of the most legendary and feared items in all of D&D. Inspiring both intrigue and trepidation, it tempts adventurers with its unpredictable powers and has gained a reputation for being game-breaking. As someone who loves chaos in their games, I love this item. However, I have to admit that it does have the potential to create some certified not-fun moments in your campaign. So, I decided to change that. I'm going to go through every card in this deck, talk about what they do, why they're good or bad, and change them if they have the potential to break your game so you can use it in your campaign without worry. So with that out of the way, let's jump into the Deck of Many Things. Let's go alphabetically, starting off with Balance. Your mind suffers a retching alteration, causing your alignment to change. Lawful becomes chaotic, good becomes evil, and vice versa. This card might not mean much, especially if you're a newer player, because alignment has kind of been tending outwards of the D&D scene, but if you're an older player or just like to play with alignment, this can actually be incredibly game-breaking, for a single player at least. If you're going from playing a lawful good character and all of a sudden you're playing a chaotic evil character, you're not playing the same character anymore, and your fun was probably tied to that lawful good character you had that effectively no longer exists. So this is a card that I did end up changing. I made a pretty significant change to this card, and it could be looked at as a net positive. However, it's worth mentioning that this card really did not have a good fix in my mind if we kept it with the whole alignment thought process. So rather than changing alignment, I had this change your stats. Specifically, you choose one physical stat and one mental stat and reduce one of them by two and increase the other by two. So effectively, you're trading physical for mental or mental for physical stats. I wanted to keep the same theme as the whole balance idea, but I needed to move away from the alignment because alignment can very drastically change a player's character. So if someone does draw the balance card, they can change their stats however they see fit, and this may be a positive or a negative, but realistically this card would be a net positive, meaning that this is one of the only cards, actually I think it is the only card that I changed from a negative card to a positive card. Next up, we have the Comet card. If you single-handedly defeat your next foe you encounter, you gain a level. The problem with this card, I think is pretty obvious, is the fact that you, Whoever drew this card has to single-handedly defeat the next foe you encounter, meaning that you alone, without your party, has to defeat whatever monster you encounter next. Now, that might be a goblin, it might be a devil, you don't know. The biggest problem with this card is that it encourages solo play. What's the number one rule of D&D? Don't split the party, and this card asks you to split the party. The main reason I changed the Comet card is because it encourages solo play, and D&D is a collaborative game, not a solo game. So I had to adjust that because, let's be honest, no one enjoys when a single player has an hour of gameplay by themselves. I kept this card with the same theme of if you defeat the next monster. However, I changed what you get from it and who gets what from it. If you and your group defeat the next hostile creature you encounter without anyone going unconscious in that encounter, then each of you gains a powerful boon. Now that boon takes the shape of a feat. That is very powerful, however, it does not disrupt the levels of the characters, and quite honestly, I think it's more fun because it encourages group play rather than solo play. Next up, we have one of the most detrimental cards in the entire deck, Donjon. You disappear and become entombed in a state of suspended animation in an extra dimensional space, and no one can find you short of a wish spell. I feel like there's no reason that I need to explain why this card is game-breaking. This absolutely ruins the game for a single player. Granted, that single player did take the risk of drawing from the deck of many things. However, this means effectively you're not going to be able to find that character until your party gains access to the wish spell. Now, that might come from the deck itself, or it might come when you hit 17th level, whatever comes first. And let's be honest, after you draw the dungeon card, you're probably not going to want to draw any more cards from this deck. This is very clearly game-breaking for obvious reasons, so what I did was rather than have this affect the player specifically, I actually kind of kept the same idea with it, only I made it specific to the player's environment. What I did was when a player pulls this card, 
a mail carrier delivers you a message or a ransom note stating that a friendly NPC has been taken hostage by a local criminal organization. And that ransom note describes a meeting location, a meeting time, and a list of demands. The players have to meet at that certain time, and if they do not meet that list of demands with all of at the same location that time, uh, the day after that, that friendly NPC is dead. Your friend got kidnapped, go save him or he dies. That way, it opens up a new story aspect of the game rather than a, sorry, you just don't get to play that character anymore. Yes, it is much less detrimental than what it originally was, but I think it opens up more story, which really is kind of why we're playing DD in the first place. So yeah, that's Don John. One of the worst cards in the entire deck. But next up, we move to Uriel. This card's Medusa-like visage curses you and you take a minus two penalty to saving throws permanently. The only thing that can remove this curse is a god or the fates card. While the Donjon makes it so you can't play your character because they're stuck in a suspended animation, the Uriel card makes it so your player does not want to play your character, that character anymore because they're just not playing it effectively since they have a minus two to every saving throw. Now, I removed the whole only a deity or the fates card can remove this curse, and the main reason I did that is because if you draw this card, like Donjon, you're not going to feel good about wanting to draw again and risk the fates card or something else that's positive or potentially negative. Alongside that, the only honest way that you can get this in core D&D removed aside from the fates card is something like Divine Intervention, which is a very, very low chance of actually occurring. This card just makes it so the player can't effectively play their character and that makes it thereby not fun. So I just got rid of that and honestly I think this card's fine as it is. Now we move on to the next one, Flames. A powerful devil becomes your enemy. It seeks to ruin and plague your life, savoring your suffering before attempting to slay you. Yeah, I, uh, I left this card as it was because I think that opens up some awesome plot points. Next, The Fool. You lose 10,000 experience, and if losing that much XP would cause you to lose a level, instead you lose just enough to remain at your current level, and you draw again. This is another card that I changed, and the main reason is because not all tables use experience. Alongside the fact, a player losing something is not necessarily fun. Now, I will say, there are cards in this deck that can take things away from players, which I think is very warranted because this deck is supposed to be potentially very dangerous. However, there's already enough cards that take other things away from players, like items, gold, whatever. So I changed this card to be pretty different. Rather than removing 10,000 XP, uh, effectively you have to draw another card, but the next card that you draw that is a positive effect is negated. As a DM who likes to use Milestone, I think that works a lot better. But moving on to the next one, we have Gem. This one is a doozy. Uh, you gain 50,000 GP worth of gold and gems. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this can be bananas. Uh, however, I will say I did not change this. The main reason I didn't change this is because quite honestly, I couldn't think of another way to adjust it. <laughs> 50,000 gold is a lot of gold, especially considering that is on the verge of very rare to legendary gold worth of item. However, you also have to take into consideration where you get this deck when you get this deck. If you get this deck at level 10, 50,000 gold, it's a lot of gold. If you get this deck when you're level 20, 50,000 gold is like chump change. It's all relative, and I think this card is absolutely fine as it is. However, the next card is a very interesting card, the Idiot. No, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the card. What this one does is you permanently reduce your intelligence 1d4 plus 1 to a minimum of 1, and then you draw another card. Now, this card is one of those cards that obviously only negatively affects a single player. However, it is one of those cards that only negatively affects really one or two kinds of players. Either a wizard or an artificer. And I guess Eldritch Knight Fighter if we're being honest. If you're the unlucky soul that happens to be a wizard, or any type of class that you or subclass that utilizes intelligence and you draw this card, you might as well throw your character sheet in the dumpster because 1d4 plus 1 minus your intelligence, which is your main modifier, is 
effectively reducing your character to trash. Well, maybe not trash, that might be a little excessive, but you get my point. So I changed this significantly, um, mainly because I didn't want it to ruin a character per se. I wanted it to be a negative effect, but make your character still playable. And I changed this in a way that I think is very interesting. What I did was rather than reduce your intelligence, you lose one of your known languages. And if you only know one of those languages, then you become illiterate. If you are already illiterate, you instead become literate in both your main language and another random language. If you're smart when you draw this card, you lose language. If you're eh, normal like me, you become illiterate. And if you're an illiterate baboon, you instead become illiterate in your main language and learn another random language. So if you're stupid, this card's actually very good. Next, we have the Jester. This is the opposite of the Fool, where rather than losing 10,000 XP, you gain 10,000 XP and you draw two additional cards. What I did with this was effectively the inverse of what I did with the Fool. Rather than negating the next positive card, you negate the next negative card. You don't get XP, but you can draw two more cards if you want, and you can negate the next negative card you pull. So, if you draw the Jester, decide to pull another card, and let's say you pull the Flame, that gets negated. I tried to make all these cards kind of centralized and work together in a strange way, uh, so that they weren't so detrimental or uplifting to a single character. And I think that's a really good way to look at both of the Jester cards. All right, next up, we have the key. This one's pretty simple. You gain a rare magic item with which you're proficient with, and the DM chooses the weapon. It's rare or rarer magic item, but either way, you get the point. This is one of the cards I left as it is, because, let's be honest, gaining a rare magic item is pretty cool, and it's not necessarily game-breaking, so that's the key. Now we move on to one of the most questionable cards in this entire deck in my personal opinion, and that is the Knight. This is one of the cards that summons a level four fighter in your service and serves you loyally until death. This card can be cool because you know you have a Knight to fight for you, but if you get the deck of many things when it should be relevant at maybe like 13th level, a fourth level fighter does not mean much for you. What I did to change this card is effectively, rather than a knight, a wandering bard appears and it is being chased by a Dwergar warband. If you decide to aid the bard and save them from this warband, then the bard believes you are fated to meet and swears his loyalty and life to you. Only rather than fight for you, he goes around wandering in towns, telling tales of your triumphant return and how great of a person or party you are and tells stories about your adventuring group. And whenever the party goes to new towns or new NPCs and interacts with them, there's a 10% chance that the bard had been there and that individual has already heard about you and your party through the bard's stories. Now, this is all entirely up to the DM, but if that individual or the town has heard of the party, it heavily impacts their decision making and their attitude towards the party. So this can take part in if someone would be more inclined to help you, if they'd be more inclined to give you discounts or anything along those lines, or maybe even inspiring new adventures in your footsteps. I think that opens up for a huge amount of roleplay potential, and rather than gaining a 4 level fighter that will die in the next combat, you instead get some really cool renown in the world that you're adventuring in. And now we move on to the most infamous card in the entire deck, the Moon. I do want to state, I love this card, I love the deck as it is currently, I love chaos, and I love what this can do. However, if you want to talk about game breaking, getting potentially 3 wishes is game breaking. So I did change this card. This card can force the intervention of a deity sharing your alignment, acting as a successful divine intervention attempt. You can hold this card for up to a year in your inventory and use it when you need it. This is a pocket instant divine intervention rather than a wish spell. I think that is super cool. Plus the fact that it is a random deity of your alignment, meaning it doesn't necessarily have to be your deity or you don't even have to necessarily follow a deity. It just has to be a deity with your similar alignment. It doesn't break the game like a wish spell would. So I think that's a really cool way to change this while making it so you get a really cool boon in the game without making this card feel underwhelming. So that's the moon. Now we get to the next three cards or actually four cards, I think. And these next four cards, I didn't actually change because I think they're actually all okay. The Rogue. 
A non-player character of the DM's choice becomes hostile to you. The identity is unknown until they or someone else reveals it. This, cool card. I like it. Next, we have Ruin. All forms of wealth aside from magic items that you have vanish. Whether it be gold, mundane items, property, or anything of the sort, you no longer own it. Effectively, the Your Poor card now. And this is what I meant when I said earlier that there's already cards that take away things that you have without making it completely game-breakingly terrible. So this card, I kept the same. Next, the Skull. This is a fun one. The card summons the Avatar of Death and you must battle it alone or die. Each time anyone attempts to help you, another Avatar appears. Effectively, you fight the Grim Reaper. If you win, you live. If you lose, you die. That's how that goes. I kept the Skull card in there simply because it's a cool card, it's a cool aspect, and it really doesn't change much of the game itself. Next, and the last one that I didn't change, at least in the next couple of them, is Star, where you can increase your ability score by 2, and this score can exceed 20, meaning you can get a 22 in strength or a 24 in strength if you wanted to. I think this is just one of the good cards in the deck that is, you know, it's a risk-reward thing, and this is one of the really good rewards you can get. So, that star, I kept it as it is. Now, the next one. Sun. I very much changed, and that is for one main reason. But, let's talk about what it does first. Gain 50,000 XP and a wondrous item. We've already talked about why I don't like cards that give experience. 50,000 XP is a huge amount of experience. Just to exemplify this, obviously you're not going to give this to a character at level 1, but at level 1, if you get 50,000 experience, you level to level 9. It's the difference from levels 1 to 9 or level 19 to 20. This can very, very, very out of balance the game if a character gets this because one character will be multiple levels above another character. Obviously, depending upon when you get it. As well as the fact you get an item. But I did change this so it does not do that. Instead, what I did was a little bit different and a way that's more fun for everyone involved. You and your adventuring party all immediately gain a level. There you go. That's it. That's all it is. Rather than 50,000 XP to 1, you effectively split it among all your party members and everyone levels up. And that's the sun. Simple enough change and a way that doesn't disrupt the game. Another one. This one is Talon. Every magic item in your possession disintegrates immediately. Effectively the magic item variant of Ruin. I kept this one in the, in the deck because, quite honestly... It's a risk-reward thing. Losing all magic items sure would suck if you just drew a magic item from the deck and it was ruined by Talon. Next, the Fates. This is cool, and actually a really cool card as it is, but I did change it. As default, Reality's Fabric unravels and spins anew, allowing you to avoid or erase an event as if it never happened. Now, if you want to talk about game-breaking, this is the most game-breaking card in the entire deck. Because effectively, you can say... You know, the world never was created. And if you want to talk about game breaking, not having a world to stand on, oh, the creation of the world didn't happen. Boom, that card can make it happen. So I changed this. The only thing I did to change this was rather than one event never happening, I changed it to one event that you were a part of. Rather than being able to erase the creation of the universe, you can erase something that happened negatively to you or that you were involved with. So, if you walk into a bar and you hurt your head, you can erase it like it never happened. If you trip walking up the stairs in front of the girl you like, you can erase it like it never happened. Rather than erasing the universe, you're erasing something that happened in your past. So, that's how I changed the fates. Alright, we have the most hated card coming up next, and that is the Void. This is the most detrimental card next to Donjon. Actually, this is the most detrimental card, in my opinion. It rips your soul from your body, places it in an object at a random location of the GM's discretion, and that item is now guarded by powerful beings. You cannot be restored with a wish spell. You effectively, and your, or your party rather, has to find the item to restore your soul to your body. But you don't know where that is. So your party could be searching a very long time to find whatever item it is that your soul is contained in, and they then have to defeat all of those powerful entities guarding that item. This is a you don't get to play that character anymore card, just like Donjon was. And I obviously changed it. 
what I did to change the void was actually give it aspects of the Donjon card originally had, where you are pulled into a state of suspended animation in a random location, and in your space is left an ominous note describing your location and who took you, and that your party needs to come find you if they want to get you back. So that way, it is the, yeah, you don't get to play this character anymore, but it's not saying you don't get to play this character anymore until you can wish to find me. It's saying this is where you can find me if you want to dare to come risk your life. That way, it gives your players and your char other characters something to do to try to save their party member and their friend. And the player that got sucked into the interdimensional space can maybe play a one-shot character until they get their main character back. That way, we still have some incredible risk with the deck, but in a way that is not necessarily game destroying for a single character, uh, at least until you get to the maximum epic levels. The last card that I didn't change was the throne because I think this card's awesome. You gain proficiency in persuasion, double your proficiency bonus with it, and you gain ownership of a small keep if you can clear it from a group of monsters that have taken it as their home. So effectively, you get your own castle when you clear it out. I think that's pretty cool, as well as the fact that you get really good persuasion. This card can be fantastic for the Charisma characters, or even great for characters that don't have Charisma. But either way, I left this card the same because I just think it's another cool way to introduce story into your game. And now finally, the last card that I did change, and the last card in the deck, is the Vizier. But what this does is once within the next year, you may ask any question and receive a truthful, helpful response. I changed this a bit because I think using a card like this to just solve a problem is lame and doesn't feel good. So what I did was rather than that, you gain the momentary gaze of a random deity that shares your alignment. This allows you to ask them a question and you can make a check which determines how the deity will respond to your question. The DM can set the DC however they like, but effectively you roll a check. That check can be anything that deity might value. For example, a war deity like Tyr might value a show of strength or athletics, while another trickier deity like Shar might value cunning and deception. Prove to them that you're worthy of a response, and if you do so, you then get an answer. That way it's not just a, haha, I get the answer for free, it's a cool look at this real story reason as to why I got this answer, and it makes it more impactful in my general opinion. So, that's how I chained Vizier. And that's the deck of many things. Let me know what you thought in your comment section below. Uh, I read every comment, almost always reply, and who knows, I might even feature your comment in the next video. Uh, I would really like to hear what your thoughts are on how I changed the deck, and quite honestly, uh, I really like hearing feedback, because I generally like to use it in my own game if I like it enough. Uh, so, yeah, either way. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all on Friday.